Uh, there are people here, obviously, some of you I've known for many, many years and uh, we've done lots of things together. Other people I've, I've not met before. So it is, uh, I didn't quite know where to pitch this lecture. Uh, well, let, I'll say this lecture grandly. It's not really a lecture. Um, uh, so I'm just going to talk a bit about um, what I've done. Uh, so what my background is, how on earth I got into this. Um, I'll talk about then, uh, sort of I framed it around three main issues uh, to do with performing historical dance at heritage sites. And then a sort of a conclusion, well, uh, impact, impact, I've called it impact and legacy uh, to sort of close it. Um, I am very keen though to, to sort of hear questions, to open discussion about this because I do believe, for me personally anyway, it is a very important subject. Um, and, um, I, you know, I think it's one that we, I'm not here to impose, you know, any great dogma or say it should be done in a particular way. In fact, the complete opposite. And I'm very keen to open up debate and to see how we can improve and share best practice or share interesting ideas for practice as well. So, um, that's, that's where I come from. So, um, so that's who I am. I'm Charlotte Ewart. Um, uh, how on earth did I get into this? <laughs> um, I, uh, I began, well, I began dancing at well, two and a half. I trained as a dancer, went through, did an undergrad, um, trained, worked. And then one day I had a, a, an audition um, uh, for, um, it was for a handle opera at the Royal Opera House doing Baroque dance. Now, how m many of you may not know, but um, dancers don't really get taught historical dance in this country. Uh, actors do. But dancers don't. Bit of an annoyance for me. But um, uh, I was, uh, I went to this audition, it was for Baroque dance. And uh, Frances Campbell, who some of you will know, I was working with at the time. And she took me to a cloakroom at the National Theatre and tried to show me part of a raisin coupe. Uh, <laughs> I, in the cloakroom the day before. Um, I also um, did. Uh, I was also employed at the time doing an event at Stoneley Park in Coventry, which was a restoration gig. And someone said, oh, Charlotte, you're a dancer. Can you do some restoration dancing? I went, yes, of course I can. Of course I can. Not knowing what on earth I was talking about. So I phoned Barbara Siegel. And I went, Barbara, <laughs> what do I do? Um, and she taught me through the Selinger's Round. And that was about 15 years ago. And that was the first dance I ever taught. And from then it sort of, snowballed into a, a, a sort of a range of going to the what then the DHDS summer schools um, and all you know all sorts of other things I, I you know, my work has taken me I've done my MA in it now I've, I've taken I've done recreated uh, masks at Volsaver Castle Love's Welcome I've done Tempe Restored and Mask for Augers workshop at um, Backwarding House I teach at drama schools at um, for uh, acting students, I work with Passamezzo and Tamsin Lewis, some of you might, might have known as well, Whitby Abbey and the Time Will Tell company that do lots of um, work with English heritage. Um, uh, I've done lots of research on medieval dance and the Stampies, uh, medieval music in the Dales, which sadly has to be cancelled this year, we've just heard. I was just recently doing some work on Field of the Cloth of Gold and dance in Hen Henrician courts. Um, Tower of London, I am an associate artist with the Historic Royal Palaces at the moment, so recreating events on their sites. Um, and then I was pulled in to do, I taught Danny Dyer to do a, a early Tudor dance. Uh, Lucy Worsley recently to do work on, again, Henrician, Henrician, early Henrician work. Um, and I taught Gareth Malone House for Solcherelli, which was very interesting, while singing. Um, I am very much a medieval renaissance type of girl. I leave the Baroque and the Jane Austen and the 19th century quadrilles to others who are, I, I, I'm more just, it's just because I'm more inspired by that period, by the earlier periods. I do t tip into ragtime though, and uh, Charleston, I find of late. Um, why do I do it? Like many of us, I love it. I am passionate for it. I feel that these dances need to breathe and live and be up on their feet. I have a slight stubbornness about that, I think, as well. Um, Barbara Sparty um, the, uh, said these dances must be performed or they will stay fading on the pages to be enjoyed by the very few. And that's very much where I come from. Um, 
for those of you who don't know, Barbara Sparty was a, a dance historian um, who lived in Italy. He died a few years ago now, but wrote quite extensively. Um, uh, I don't think we should lose them at all. So I believe a great conduit to get these, da to get these dancers out is to get them on into these sites. Um, so I'm quite passionate about that. Um, also, and lovely Hazel Den, I've got a couple of quotes from you, Hazel, as well in this. Um, Stay faithful to the research, but open to the creative possibilities the sources can give us. So, uh, and I, that's where, uh, yeah, I'm hoping I'm not going to, you know, I don't know, be too controversial. I don't want to be that, but um, but that's where I come from, particularly. And I'll tell you some of the reasons why. So, stones in their shoes. It is rather literal in that many, uh, myself included, we have danced at heritage sites um, with on gravel driveways and got stones in our shoes. Um, it might also be used as a metaphor for uh, the time that we're living in now. We have the stone in our shoe of COVID-19. Uh, many of these sites now are shut. In fact, we are now all on Zoom uh, as becoming, is becoming the norm. Um, uh, the, the stone in our shoe of having, of the issues that I will talk about, uh, practicality, accessibility, authenticity. So, um, uh, but that doesn't mean to say that we should get on, you know, crazy about this it goes well okay the, we have stones how do we work with them how do we work with them um so uh most of the historical dance that is shown is now shown heritage sites there are of course some pieces in baroque performance that is out and of course we have tv i will sort of be mentioning tv and uh and film a little bit but you know the, the talk is performance at heritage sites. Um, I do feel there is uh, a case also for a more informed choreography that is in film and stage as well. Um, although I'm gonna try and keep it focused on, on her in, uh, heritage. Uh, we are, I've mentioned the situation we're in, the future of heritage is very precarious at the moment, very uncertain. Um, but things I am positive will eventually reopen. Um, uh, I think this is a good time. Things like these lockdown lectures will be a great time to try and raise awareness, to try and increase you know, conversation. Um, you know, many people think that dance didn't exist prior to Giselle in 1840, um, or at least don't really know what it was, apart from peasants in the field. Um, so I think this could be a really exciting time that we can grasp and, and, and grow from that. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is what I've learned from the events that I have done, uh, problems that I've needed to solve, that I've encountered, um, uh, some ideas maybe or open for discussion for the future. Um, now some of you I know have been involved in performance at Average Church yourself, um, uh, or and very many event, different events as well. Uh, this is a time that we can share practice as well. Um, I don't claim to have all the answers. I'm only speaking from the experience that I have and the ways that I have solved problems myself or the ways that I view these issues. Shouldn't always keep using the word problems. Um, but ultimately, let's just try and improve the quality of what we put out, but also and raise the greater awareness in the world of these wonderful, wonderful works that exist. Um, um, making it accessible. So, oh look, I was going to show you some pictures. I'll try and do that now. I don't know. These are pictures from um, some of the events that I've done. That was at Banquet, Banqueting House, the Te Tempe Restored. Uh, that was Love's Welcome at Bolsover Castle. That was Mask of Augers, which was performed a couple of times actually. You see a beautiful shot of the bear mask. They had to try to work how to dance in these bear masks, which was certainly a practical issue. That's Whitby Abbey. Um, uh, which I'll come to, that, which serves some very um, uh, interesting <laughs> issues for dancing. Um, so the points that I've drawn into put to consideration are practicality, accessibility, audience and entertainment, authenticity, and then finally I'll conclude with impact and legacy. So the where, who, how and why. Um, there they are pictures from the Tower of London and, uh, and Hampton Court there. I was very pleased with the Volta lift. Uh, because many people thought it couldn't be done in a wheel farthingale and I went ha ha 
Yes, it can. Experiential or experimental archaeology there in practice. So practicality. Um, so uh, going back to Whitby, actually, um, uh, limitations and restrictions of sight. Uh, health and safety is a ver the first thing whenever I'm employed to do an event like this. It doesn't matter what ground ideas you have or what you, how much you know about the subject um, or what, you, what dances you think might be appropriate there and there and there and there. You might arrive at the site and they'll go, no, you can't do it there. Or no, there's a bloody great big pillar there and there's um, not just stones but rocks. And you're doing this at seven o'clock in the evening or in October and it's going to be raining and a massive gale and you've got no cover and um, so it's slippery, it's too slippery for the dancers to work in. So practicality, basic practicality is when you're working at heritage sites is always the first thing that you have to, you have to encounter. Um, the health and safety issues, um, the limitations and restrictions of the site curatorially. Um, Hampton Court, for example, there is no inside dancing space. You are not allowed to dance inside anywhere at Hampton Court Palace. Um, so anything that you do has to be done outside. Uh, that main picture there that you see uh, with the beautiful sort of uh, arms extended, they're my stu American students. Um, that was the last inside space, uh, which was a kitchen space at Hampton Court Palace, which has now been turned into a gift shop. Um, and you can see there's a big screen behind it. So yeah, it worked okay as a space to present a historical performance in, but it's now been gone. It's now taken away. So we can't dance anywhere inside. Um, uh, rehearsal time is often very, very restricted and limited. So you might be working with people that you've worked with before, or you might be working with people that you've never worked with before. So I've often had to, to create um, a work with an afternoon of performance. So maybe two at the most four hours. Um, a TV, it's even worse. What you saw with Danny Dyer was what I did. I had no rehearsal with him whatsoever. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, you have a lot of pressure for rehearsal. Um, that then knocks on to availability of dancers. And I say sort of dancers in quote, often it's actors, not to say that actors can't dance. Some of them are very, very good movers. Um, dancers may have had no training in historical dance, which is another issue, a pra very practical, very basic level. Um, people, trained dancers can often pick things up very, very quickly. Um, sometimes um, actors, who, they may be good movers, they may not be. So again, you have limited rehearsal time. Practically speaking, you have to often adapt what you have planned um, because of um, the situation that you're placed in. Uh, uh, there is, I think, a big hole, I've already mentioned, that I think dancers sh should be taught historical dance. Oh, how I wish, one day <laughs> before I die. Um, it would, you know, I think to get a good quality of um, presented historical dance in a public space, um, people need to be trained in it. Um, and, um, you know, uh, in a, uh, there is also the problem, though, if you train people, they need to have work. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg. If there's no work to perform, no space to work, to perform this work, why would people train in it? So it is an issue, I have a very, very uh, yeah, current issue. But um, and finally money, <laughs> finance. That's what's gonna get us all in the next year or so, because um, heritage is suffering as I've mentioned. Um, but let's be positive. Um, uh, I, there is a, a point that I have raised on occasion before in terms of I do, this is my job. Alongside teaching, I teach and I get employed to create work. I get paid to do that. There are of course in the industry people who do it for free. Um, and that's great if you can afford to do it. Um, I believe, and someone once told me many, many years ago, that you get valued by what you charge, your work is valued by what you charge. And I, I would like everyone to start to actually charge for what they do, even if it's a nominal fee, because they're, they're, money is going to be an issue in heritage in the future. 
but that doesn't mean to say we should necessarily give away our many years in some cases of research of training of talent and uh, and i think we should value what we do we should really really value what we do and um uh, and that will create because people then just start to view it with a different eye directors event managers curators they will view it with a different eye they will value it and they will see just to actually the, the advantage that it can bring to something so uh yes budgets are always tight there but they'll always the amount of times directors and produce, or producers have said to me oh we haven't got any money or oh, we haven't got any money and then somehow the money appears um so uh i do firmly believe that i do think we need to work with that uh, so, uh, the next one, uh, it draws me on to, that's practicality. The first thing that you have to look at is, um, grand ideas aside, you've got to go, well, what can you do? Can't do anything in the Great Hall at Hampton Court. How do I stage it elsewhere? I've found a space. Excellent. I can do that. What now is the, why are we doing it? How accessible do I need to make it? What's the objective? What's the director's objective to this? And that's accessibility. So oh, actually, there's me doing various things and there's some other <laughs> lovely photographs um, from again, Hampton Court. That was the Lucy Worsley um, craziness that we did. Um, the audience is not accessibility in terms of how do you get access to the site? It's accessibility for audience. Um, who and why is it? Um, does the audience understand it? Is the audience entertained by it? And I think this is where perhaps we have uh, work to do as well. Um, if Because if there is no audience, there'll be no show. Um, if the shows aren't entertaining, we need to make people return and bring a friend uh, type of thing. Um, there is a solid body of academic work out there, you know, but that's yeah, you know, we need to open that up to, and that's partly why I work in the realm I work in in historical sites because it brings it to a wider audience. Um, they don't necessarily. The many years I've been working at these sites, they don't necessarily want to know in-depth information, not just about dance, but about anything now. But um, you know, to see the spectacle, to create the spectacle, is. Um, is I, I think an important and cru crucial thing for us on the micro level of dance. Um, uh, uh, the uh, return, I mean, return to the quotes in the intro as well. These pay the dances won't they won't live on the pages. We need to get them up on their feet. We need to perform them. They need to be seen. Uh, will they be understood in the same context that they were first written in? Hmm. Will they be viewed with the same eyes? No um will they have to be adapted to different cir performance circumstances to the ones that they were first set in yes they will because of what i've just said about practicality i can't recreate a mask from the jacobean era in the banqueting house in exactly the same manner as was in the jacobean period because i'm not allowed to we can't use torches we're not allowed to use seat seating we can't there's all a whole host of practicality issues that we can't means we can't do it um but uh accessible well, i do think we have a responsibility as practitioners to make our work as accessible as entertaining um uh, while being informed as as we possibly can um we must do the best piece for the job that we are doing but historically informed which leaves me that <laughs> i put this slide in different deliberately because I'm about to now go on to the final issue, which is the thorny one of authenticity. Very thorny one when dealing with historical perform dance performance at heritage sites. And I put that in because that was work I did on a green screen, not authentic. And, but the same job, I then had to wear that while dancing around a room in Kensington Palace with those shoes on, making the same noise at the same time, you know, to create a film's piece I mean, that's, you know, it, it's, and it, I look a bit weird in it, everyone says. Um, uh, so authenticity, here we go, the thorny one. Um, in the context of often when I'm commissioned to do pieces, it is often the first or the last thing thought about. Uh, if it's the first, it often then becomes the least important. <laughs> 
um, to be honest with you. Uh, many a time I've been asked, I've had directors in the thing go, yeah, 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 authenticity is really important to us. And then I say, well, you need to do this and this and this. And they'll go, no, can't do that. And uh, no, I want it in long way sets, even though it's a uh, uh, Henrich and dance. <sighs> Okay, uh, but that's not right. Um, uh, so, uh, I, yeah, I'm going to draw in a little bit of academia here, although, I, as I said, I've sort of pitched this um, to be accessible to all, talking about accessibility. Um, the debate of authenticity and can you, what is authenticity? Can you make it authentic? Can you make something authentic? Has been raging for well in dance for now about twenty years. So in early music for longer, it came from early music. Um, th so the early music researchers and academics, Randall Dipper, he was the first one. James Young, Stephen Davis, David Davis. They they created well what is they lists of different types of authenticity. Um, is it authenticity of musical instrument? Is it authenticity of even vibration of the sound in the room as when it first occurred? Um, that was one of them. <laughs> um, uh, then, of course, we've taken it up and uh, a recreation or reconstruction or authentic reconstruction is now applied to modern dance as much as our period. So there's debates raging about Merce Cunningham's work, um, The Dying Swan. If you're not taught by someone who's taught by Pavlova, then it's not uh, the correct swan. Um, so. Uh, people at the Merce Cunningham Estate are saying that we can't recreate Cunningham pieces. So, um, it, it, you know, it is now very, it's very present in not just historical dance, but in dance academia. Um, Barbara Sparty, again, to draw back to her, she, she created a sort of a range of, well, is it correct era, correct costume, correct music, correct space, correct intention, correct perception? ideas that are juxtaposed and clash with each other, I would argue. Um, uh, Hodgson, who did the Rite of Spring, Archer and Hodgson, they, they make a benchmark of 50%, which some might think, well, if you've only got 50% of evidence, but they say, no, that's enough. Um, and then they create from that, they get inspired from that. Um, Anne Hutchinson Guess, you came up with different uh, definitions of reconstruction versus recreation versus restaging. So um, the differences, or is there a difference between the two? Um, uh, another uh, dance academic, Sarah Rubridge, came up with different types of authenticity. Again, rather like the, the vibrations in the air and different musical instruments, which again can clash because you can aim for one, but that would be at odds with another. Um, uh, there is the debate over use of live music. Uh, sometimes, again, practical reasons mean you can't use live music. Um, uh, there's also musicians who teach dance, uh, historical dance at heritage events. Um, I've seen many a different horses brawl being taught um, and claim to be the authentic horses brawl, whatever that means. Um, uh, you know, so it, it's... I'll, but I'll come on to that. They, it comes down to the ontological arguments of what is the original, what is authenticity, what is authentic. Again, to return to uh, lovely Mrs. Sparty, who says that the performance of early dance for an audience in itself is unauthentic. So if we can't ever be authentic, which is part of what we do when we look at historical dance. We research the sources, we look at what's written down, and we try to build on that. If we can't do that, is there a point? Well, of course there's a point. Of course there's a point to it. So I, I try and reframe the focus. The whole part, in my opinion, you know, one of my opinions is that the whole past consists of different interpretations all sorts of different things. Uh, again, another, um, the past is it's our own modern construct as well. The Victorians were very good at that, rewriting history and rebuilding things. Um, uh, another early music, music uh, researcher, Peter Kyvey, he talks of um, that sometimes if we stick to rigid dogmatism of one thing and one thing only, uh, it, it becomes too inflexible. And working from a historically informed approach, perhaps, or certainly in, a, in the field that I work in is, the, uh, is a way that I have to approach things. 
um, uh, because I will never be able to get to, for example, even use the original space. So I will always have to adapt, but come from the sources first. Um, uh, I've already said I've seen many a different horses brawl. I mean, the same dance can be danced at different heritage sites, different events. It can be performed in so many different ways, and that not necessarily is a problem because there are many different types of horses, as I said. So we could be aiming at different things. Is it accessible for the audience? Is it entertaining? Do they understand what they're doing? Then great. Um, what start maybe to occur sometimes is if people start saying no this is the definitive this is how it is this is how it was and so that's how we do it um uh in another this was highlighted again in about 10 years ago god how time flies by cecilia Nottily, um saying it's and i believe this is an importance coming back to uh, accessibility um there is there can be confusion in the public mind they're unable to discern the difference between the medieval world and the renaissance between the noble and the popular between the social and the theatrical between the fancied middle ages and the renaissance and real history i've mentioned that many tv directors they only they like everything to be in long way sets regardless of t of era of performance um, it's because that's what they know that's what they've seen um, they believe that that's how that's that's history history dance um, uh, and I believe we have a responsibility when doing these events when showing these things part of our responsibility is to right that wrong is too harsh but to show the alternative not everyone did dance in long way sets all the way through the through the world and there is a difference between medieval and renaissance uh, early renaissance and late renaissance there is a difference and it is partly our responsibility to open that and to show that Dance at heritage sites is for the public. It's not for us, it's for the public. It's for the, the viewers who are watching it. Um, they are the people that we have a responsibility to show the right things. Um, uh, I have to make choices when doing these things. I'm, I will close, Lottie, I'm getting to the end. Um, uh, there are, I believe, in fact, this is uh, Moira Goff, I've got, came out with a, uh, a quote. Um, which I think again sums up, I have to make subjective choices. Um, she stated those choices of notation do not invalidate Reconstructed as long as it has objective scrutiny of academia. It can generate a wider range of possible interpretations and contributes to a process where theories could be practically tested, which can always be revived by um, further um, research, with, uh, used by further research. And, uh, yeah, the, the, it's experimental archaeology what we do to a certain extent and performing the, the opportunity to perform at these sites is wonderful and and critical to what we do but we shouldn't be bound by what we think we know we should um, use this opportunity to, ex to explore um, out on a limb I would go as far as say the practical issues of accessibility practicality you cannot be authentic but neither should you be you shouldn't become blinkered by striving for one unobtainable quest um, but uh, we should again hazel i've got one from you again we dance the 500 year old creations with the bodies and spirits of today and whilst remaining true to their creation we shouldn't lock them too safely away Today's dancers and choreographers need to realise these dances in their original context, but should not feel intimidated to treating them as an art artefact. This is theatre that we're producing. This is entertainment that we're producing. Well, certainly I am on a, on a heritage site. And if you, anyone goes onto a heritage site to, to perform these things, to, to create this work, we need to bear that in mind. We're creating a theatre which should be entertaining, it should be accessible, it should be understood. And if it's not understood in the same way as 400 years ago, then we can talk about that. But we can also explain why maybe we will never get there. So to conclude, of course we must value these sources. Of course we would, not just the written, but the accounts, the, the iconography, um, the music, um, uh, the allegory, the, all the allegorical stuff that we have, everything, um, but we mustn't be bound by them. So whenever I work at, an, at a site, 
Um, uh, I have a responsibility to do the best job I can to be informed by the work, but also to then create a piece of work that will be viewed by a modern audience and understood and enjoyed by a modern audience. Um, I mean, my work at the, the experimental archaeology side, the work I did on the Mask of Augers was uh, phenomenal in understanding the space of the banqueting house and the banquet hall, even though we couldn't do it with torches and rake seating. Um, it needs to be flexible and pliable. We need to work from a flexible and pliable uh, source. Um, there is a thing, of course, this may, even this idea might not be new. Again, uh, Natili talks about Domenico. Good old Domenico. He deconstructed his contemporary dance repertory in order to create a new one. It's still linked to the Middle Ages, but he created, he fragmented and he created something new. We can do that as well. Start, we can take the bait. We need to work from baseline. I, that is important but we need to open it up to a new and a younger audience. Let them find inspiration as well from these old dancing masters and mistresses. Find new ways to interpret the spaces. Bring the dancers to life off the page as much as bringing these stony ruins to life as well. Um, I subtitled this original paper uh, as Domenico in a miniskirt. Why not? Um, stay, you know, stay true, again, stay informed, but these are things that we can work creating an atmosphere of the past but also speaking to a modern theatrical audience um I will, there we go oh look i even said it all there <laughs> but i'm terrible it seems very difficult to use a powerpoint with um but there you are so as that picture my last picture at the top you can see something perhaps more traditional at the bottom but then my my dear students there using masks and creating something new um, from an informed basis but taking inspiration from that we can do a different you know we can do do both but um and i do believe again this is although we're in difficult times we are in an exciting place that we can build i believe we can build from so thank you very much that is my uh the my thoughts I, mean, I still won't call it a lecture. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, so I hand it over to uh, if anyone wants to comment. <laughs> first one. Oh my God, I did the first one. <laughs> Lottie, is anyone, have I, are they all asleep? Or <laughs> I think they were just so enraptured. That... Alina's just put a, uh, a message. Uh, has, so Alina, if you can't see the chat, I'll read the questions. She's just said, have you ever had to find, find money for performance myself? Um, yes and no, in that um, uh, I'm often employed by people who've had, who've been commissioned or employed by um, as companies by uh, English Heritage, Historic Royal Palaces, um, or projects. I've done projects with universities who come with academic funding. So they've put in a grant application. So there's sort of two ways where uh, they, um, if I'm employed by a historical site or a company working directly with a historical site, then that will have a budget. Um, so often I've had to pitch for money from, from that budget and do costings and budgeting directly to English Heritage, for example. And then they will say, yeah, we've got that much money or no, we've got half that money and see what you can do and do the same thing. <laughs> um, um, uh, for um, particularly academic uh, grants, again, they are there or arts councils as well. I've never written one myself on my own, although I've been involved in grant writing applications. Um, it, but it is a, it's an, it's an art form. Um, uh, so yeah, so that would be, you, there is money, there's arts council funding, there's AHRC funding, there's private funding. Um, you have to apply for it. Uh, but there, oh, someone's had to go next Zoom meeting. Bye. Um, so that's, I hope that answers that question, uh, Alina. Um, so yeah, the, if you need to find money, find someone who's good at writing a grant application, an Arts Council grant application, um, or get attached to um, uh, 
well it's good well yeah find someone who's good at writing an arts council grant application <laughs> there we go anyone else um Hilary, hillary's just come in with a question of where does the inspiration for performing in heritage sites come from do i approach them or do they contact me and how much of a vision did they come up come up with or do they leave the creative vision up to you um so sometimes it's 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 largely they i am they come up with an idea for an event and then i will say well you can have this this and this this um working within the parameters um i have I, when work through my associate artist work with with historical palaces, I have been able. I've had the door open, so I can go to them and say, "Should we do an event like this, or should we include this in the event?" So I've had the ear of someone that they've gone, "Oh yeah, that's a good idea." So we've been able to include a, for example, I did a big dance piece, uh, a big galliard. In fact, I created a, a galliard a section uh, because I was there and I was able to to pitch it to them. Um, uh so, but mainly it is them coming to me with an, uh, an event and then i come up with the creative idea for it uh whitby abbey they said they would they, it's of course based around dracula and so i went to them and i said right so as part of the event for whitby abbey for dracula i can create this section i can create this 10 minute piece of dance which is based on that and there's where it's that's where it's come from um most people in the heritage sector in events don't really know anything about historical dance so they have to be guided they have to be led and they have to be educated um so uh it's about working same with t tv actually it's about they come you know, many of us have been on the phone to researchers talking about this you know different aspects of of uh, yeah yeah you know like what can you explain this bit of dance and what was going on then and what was going on there because it's not widely known it's not it's not it's not widely um uh, shown or um, you know so it's it's often um, the so that's how I work it's it's they will have the event the cloth of gold and then I will pitch to them well let's recreate a end of evening revel uh, that would have taken place in uh, after the tour, the days tilt the day at the tilt and then they come back to me and they say, so, oh, great idea, Charlotte, but we haven't got any money for it. <laughs> so I'm just giving it back. Um, so that's how it works. Um, so Hilary, I hope that's answered that question. Um, Peter has asked, is there a difference between working, uh, working an audience, at, between working an audience and working for someone, i.e.g. a film director or, or, remote, or with a remote audience? What do you mean, like working with a live audience or working with a, or working for film? I don't quite understand I'm, that. I'm presuming that's what he meant, yeah. Yeah. Um, or is there a difference between different types of um, audience? What's, what's the difference between doing something well, on there, there is a difference between oh. having an audience in front of you that you can work, isn't there? Yeah. And filming for an audience that will never... <laughs> will never see it. <laughs> yeah. Never see it. Peter speaking. He's no, typing. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, there is a right. There, well, that's two. I think that's two things. There is a practical um, difference in that when you're, it's the difference between live theatre and film, uh, as as any sort of performance or piece of work that you do. If you're working in live theatre, of course, you're working in a different space. You're there. The audience is there. It's immediate. Um, you are working in a different area, often a bigger area. If you work on film, you are not necessarily working, you're working in sections, you're doing retakes. Often the area that you have is a lot smaller. Uh, live theatre, you have a lot more, um, uh, or live events, you have a lot more rehearsal time. Theatre, uh, TV, sorry, barely any rehearsal. Um, and um, uh, but you know it's very it's very uh, you know so yeah uh, you have to make a lot of adaptations and a lot of choices very very quickly. Um, the work again I always even with TV I always try and root right the way back into 
working from the source to the to realizing so it's an informed basis knowing that in the edit it will get muddled up anyway so uh for example uh the stuff the stuff i did at christmas lucy worsley i did dance to clubs in the edit i did that i did that as it was written in the edit it wasn't what was shown so uh you know it uh, you know and again i had how long to teach that to about 15 people i had maybe 20 minutes uh they did it but you know that would that was that was what i had that was how i had to work so there is difference um in terms of there's practical differences there's space differences there's rehearsal differences um is there a difference in the work uh i don't think so because actually i i take every single event as an individual every single job that i do every single um choreography that I create, I, every objective that I'm working towards is an individual, is a different one. Um, they, they can be related and I can draw from different things, but it's still a new thing. It's still a new thing that I'm creating and working from. So if it's a live audience or if it's a filmed audience or, or filmed working for, on, on film, it's, it's still the same. I come from the same working, um, theories of you know being going back going working right what can what do i want to do and then what can i do and then i try and mesh it in the middle um and it's only really the it's the practical issues that are the first thing that is always a, a problem not problem let's look at it positively <laughs> things to overcome <laughs> um who and now alona has just popped in hello alona um uh, when you're making performance, uh, you have different groups to work or you can pick dancers. Ah, good question, Lona. Uh, I, right, I try and, so she's asked, can I pick up, um, do I use the same dancers um, or do I work with different people? I have probably half a dozen people now who I've worked with probably four or five times on different things who I have learned, I've taught them, particularly with Renaissance, I've taught them a basic Renaissance step vocabulary um, so they're actors um, there's a couple of dancers that I used at the Laban Center who are still knocking around which Anne would have worked with um, so uh, uh, they that I call them back in because they they know uh, they are familiar with the step choreography the problem is is the regularity of work in that there isn't enough work for them to just do it as one job uh, it's like uh, you know so they have to take on many many different jobs they may or may not be available when another job comes up so we have to use different people um sometimes i often i use my students as well which events managers time to getting back actually and hinchliffe to the work to the um question about money um and i i do often use students and pay them expenses and a nominal fee which probably is a bit cheeky but it's always a good thing because it's their students. But it's one way around the budget issue, <laughs> using students, but then, and it, cre it still creates from that events manager's perspective, it still means that they see it as a, as a they, they value it, they value it, and they also go, oh yes, aren't we doing good? We're using students and expanding their, their horizons and giving them opportunities. Um, but it is one way around financial issues. So I often use students, I have a body, very, very small number of people who are um, familiar with some of the steps, but it's very difficult to keep a regular um, band because there's just not the work. The work doesn't exist to survive. So, um, so it's sort of, it's a mixture. Um, yeah, and then uh, Elaine is Yeah, Elaine's asked uh, a question about audience. Uh, and if we maybe say that's our last question, if anyone's got anything absolutely burning, uh, but we've been an hour or so, so. Yeah. If you just answer that last question for Elena. Uh, I mean, what's your idea of what the audience want to see in terms of dance? Goodness. Mm. <laughs> it's a very long uh, question. <laughs> yeah, really, thanks for that. <laughs> um, right, I, I think if we dance with, if we produce work that is good quality, that um, is 
now I use this word just to say that not to say that things aren't entertaining but that is exciting visually exciting to a modern audience I think they are a modern audience after all whatever that means um, but that um, that maybe needs some contextualizing um, or explaining but in order for them so they don't lose interest in fact they then um, they get maybe to get drawn in by it but I think ultimately whatever we do if we do it with passion and excitement if we show that passion and enjoyment that we have I've often seen people dancing very po-faced not, not just dancing actually but playing but doing all sorts of things taking things far too seriously um just very if we can show enjoyment and bring these dances to an, uh, you know, with the, the, the life and the love and the passion that they are there, then I think it, you know, what we do will be interesting to an audience. It's a difficult question that because it's a bit like, well, what plays, you know, if I was a writer, what do I want audience to see? I, I, I think that's maybe why I've, uh, and I will be quick, but that's why I've rooted in the periods that I have it's not that I don't, I haven't learned Baroque or, or, or um, 19th century, but it, I don't, it doesn't excite me. Renaissance excites me. It, it excites me. Other people might go, oh my goodness gracious, what a boring period. <laughs> Give me Jane Austen any day. And that's fantastic. You know, there is no, that's brilliant that we are all different. Um, and I, I, believe that um you know if we show that passion you know then audience will audiences will come audiences will watch and they will see that it doesn't have to be something so um weird and an alien to them the past is an alien country whatever that i forget the quote now but it's also something that is still us as well so we're still all human beings and the dances are it's the mother of all art so and you know we should we should share that um, in in as interesting way as an informed but as exciting and entertaining and interesting and as passionate way as possible